Dear viewers, a warm welcome from Berlin to our FX webinar on governing for 2050, climate framework laws in the EU, the US and beyond. My name is Anne Riedel. I'm a fellow at Ecologic Institute, a Berlin-based think tank on environmental policy and coordinator of our internal legal team. FX stands for Energy Future Exchange. It's a joint project of Ecologic Institute with our sister institute in the US and the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. The project is funded through the European Union's program on transatlantic civil society dialogue. FX aims to create dialogue and exchange on a range of energy and climate policy related issues, specifically renewable energies, energy efficiency and innovative mobility. Today's webinar on the topic of framework climate laws is part of a series of webinars that you can join live, like today, and rewatch online at your own convenience. Today, we'll be looking at climate framework laws in the EU, the US, and other parts of the world to give you a sense of the different answers to the question of how to organize and manage governmental action. It needs to be short term, uh, meeting short term targets, but at the same time, also starting the long term transformation towards climate neutrality. Personally, I'm a member of the German delegation to the climate negotiations under the Paris Agreement, and as such, I'm only too aware of the necessity of national initiatives to put ambitious climate policy into action. With us today to tell us about their work are two colleagues and experts who can share insights from their ongoing work on the topic. Let me introduce them to you. We have Michael Meling. He's the Deputy Director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a research scientist with the MIT Energy Initiative and a visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde. His recent work has focused on carbon pricing and other policies to address environmental impacts of the energy system. As a lawyer by training, he has been advising governments on a range of different types of climate policy instruments, including also framework laws. Our second expert is Matthias Duve. He is the head of the climate team here at Ecologic Institute in Berlin, focusing on EU climate and energy policy. His main work area over the last four years have been the climate governance instruments, in particular long-term strategies and framework laws. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Before Thank we you. start, I invite our audience to participate actively with questions to our presenters. For this, you can use the chat or question box in your controls. I will see those questions and moderate them then to our presenters. So please indicate to whom your question is directed to one or both of them. And I think with that, without further ado, let us go straight into it. And my first question goes to Michael. Um, welcome, first of all. Uh, thank you for joining us from our transatlantic uh, setup. Um, and please tell us a little bit about the motivations that governments have for putting climate governance frameworks into place. Sure, Anne, thank you. Um, and I hope our transatlantic connection holds up. Um, the weather, at least on this side of the Atlantic, is a little bit inclement, as they say euphemistically, so it's rather cold outside, but so far so good. So I'll say a few words about climate framework laws specifically. I want to uh, make us think a little bit about what we understand um, under that concept and, and then highlight a few trends as well and then shift over to explaining why countries are doing this before finally um, handing it back to you. And then I think Matthias will go into a lot more detail on looking at actual examples of that. Um, so first of all, if you would um, kindly move to the first slide in my deck, so the next one after the title slide, you know, there's this wonderful database that I can only recommend to listeners um, to use. It's the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment's um, global database global on, on climate change laws of the world. And it, it really is, I think, the best go-to collection of what are countries doing in law, in regulations on climate change. Um, really a, a great resource. Um, and they have highlighted over the years this trend that you can really see a significant growth in the number of um, regulatory and legal instruments that countries have adopted to deal with climate change, mitigation and adaptation over time. Um, and interestingly, and I think Matthias will pick up on this later as well, you can sort of see a slight correlation with important conferences of the parties to the UNFCCC. That's where you kind of see peaks in, in legislative activity. If we look at the next slide, you can see this sort of um, headline number that over roughly 10 years, no, 20 years, you had a 20-fold increase in, in laws, climate legislation around the world in their database, which really suggests you know, that activity has picked up as countries have become more focused, more engaged um, with climate policy um, overall. However, and if we now go to the next slide, 
you know, the definition that they use for this is, is very broad. And even within that database, they do acknowledge that some laws are what they call framework laws. And I think it's a good term to use, climate framework legislation, but it's really only a small subset of those more than 1,200 laws around the world that deal in one way or another with climate change. Um, in fact, if you take a relatively strict definition, you, you arrive at less than a couple of dozen laws that are really framework laws per se. The Grantham Research Institute defines them as a law or regulation with equivalent status, which serves as a comprehensive unifying basis for climate change policy, which addresses multiple aspects or areas of climate change mitigation or adaptation or both in a holistic overarching manner. Now that's a, a mouthful, but um, it is, I think, a very useful starting point. But if we go to the next slide, there's one thing that I underlined there in that definition, which I think, um, you know, for lawyers at least, uh, makes us, gives us a, a, a brief pause, and that is that this definition is very functional. So it looks at sort of what is the, the approach chosen in the laws, but not necessarily um, the form of the, of the, of the laws. It, it includes, as I mentioned previously, it includes substatutory regulations with equivalent status. Well, for lawyers, of course, and political scientists and others that deal with laws and, 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 and you know, the, using the law to implement policies, there is, of course, a very important distinction between formal statutory law and other forms of law, laws which can be decrees, regulations, ordinances, etc., that the executive branch has adopted. In, in fact, it's very important, I think, to distinguish between those laws, those statutory laws that have been adopted by the legislature, which is the body endowed with you know, the, the, the legitimacy to adopt legislation and also can bind the executive branch. That's very important. So between election cycles, you often have very significant policy changes and political changes in the executive. Look at the U.S., for instance. Statutory law, parliamentary law can bind the executive and ensure greater continuity there and also accountability of the executive branch. So I would suggest that we strict use a slightly stricter maybe definition what what climate framework legislation really is what we want to talk about today and that is really overarching statutory climate legislation which has been formally adopted by the legislature and has that unifying umbrella function but also can bind and hold accountable um, the executive branch of government and now to the next and final slide in my part here that is um, why climate framework legislation what is of interest here um, so what's the, the rationale, what's the motivation of, of governments, of countries, really of, well, electorates around the world to decide to adopt such framework legislation? And I think there's a number of points that one can list. This is actually an area that's still relatively new. There's not much literature and writing. Um, Ecologic Institute has contributed a lot of thinking on this. But some of the points that one can kind of draw, I think, from from both work on this and and the what whatever has been written on it so far and that is well of course it elevates the visibility of climate policy by having it in sort of a a, a headline you know a flagship law you make it a lot more influential it, it, it just stands out more as a priority of a country alongside other uh, policies and also importantly alongside other agencies within government typically you know this strengthens the role of whichever ministry for instance is in charge of climate policy vis-a-vis other ministries that have potentially at times conflicting or competing mandates. It creates this, it gives this clear mandate for climate action, which can not only increase, you know, the credibility domestically, but also vis-a-vis -vis partners abroad. If you have a country that has adopted a flagship climate framework law, it sends, I think, a signal that's very visible, that's very clear um, to other countries. And I think the U.S. is a good example because it lacks that. I'll talk about that um, later on in the webinar. Many countries think there's nothing happening, but that's of course not true, only that we don't have that symbol, that signal of a framework law that sends the message to, to other countries what we're doing. Um, now for developing countries in particular, it can also be sort of a good lever to help mobilize international climate finance to create that credibility, that trustworthiness um, that the donor countries often and donor agencies look for um, in the commitment of countries to climate policy. Um, and I think it also helps because they often enshrine targets, and Matthias will say more about that as well, that these climate framework laws, that to the extent that they have some sort of measurable, quantified target, they really focus action across all levels of government and all different sectors of the economy. 
to achieve these targets and to mainstream climate action across different policy areas. Minimizing fragmentation, which really I think is a big issue in many jurisdictions, streamlining climate action. But again, to get back to, I think the most important aspect of having sort of this statutory formal climate law is the durability, the continuity of climate policy across election cycles. Of course, the parliament cannot bind itself and cannot prevent itself from changing laws going down the road. But everybody who's followed climate policy knows that it's easier to change substatutory government policy than to change a formal law. So it does create sort of this greater durability and long-term uh, framework. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, it can help hold the government, the executive branch accountable when there's a clear departure between government policy and the targets, the commitments, the objectives that are set out in the law. So that would be my sort of try, attempt to summarize the rationale, why our country is actually turning to this and why is it good for the climate? Thank you so much, Michael. Um, maybe if you have anything to add right now, Matthias, I would have a question and we also have two questions from the audience. Cool. Um, I'm good. So maybe, uh, so first of all, then sort of administration, administrative question from the audience, if the slides are going to be made available uh, afterwards. Uh, I mean, we can, we'll also link you later to the website at the end of the webinar where you can rewatch the webinar as a whole. So you'll be able to see the slides as well. And of course, if our esteemed presenters uh, agree, we'll, we'll be happy to be approached to, to share those slides um, as well, I can say. But um, maybe, maybe a quick uh, follow-up question to your, um, what you just said, Michael, um, regarding the durability uh, that, that the statutory um, climate laws can, can ensure. Has there been any example, as, as far as you know, as, at least, um, where this hasn't worked, where, you know, new, after an election cycle, uh, a whole climate law has been abolished or, or reversed? Or has that proven, I mean, it's a relatively recent development, so of course, um, there haven't been that many use cases, maybe, uh, where that was possible, but maybe mm -hmm. something aware of, of one of those examples. Well, frankly, I think that the, the what we have been seeing in changes in government and changes in political majorities in those countries that have climate framework laws is actually that it's worked quite well as a mechanism to ensure some continuity of climate policy. Um, I'm thinking of, well, for instance, the UK. I mean, you know that there, of course, the, the Climate Change Act was um, adopted under a different government um, than the current one. And to some extent, I think the Independent Climate Change Committee has been put into a position of holding the government accountable to how it's departing in some ways from that which the previous, which the parliament had in a previous, under, alongside a previous um, government um, enshrined in the law. Um, and yeah, we, we can't, like in the US, it's kind of the reverse. We see what happens when there's no climate framework law, no statutory law, that you have this radical changes, really pivots in climate policy from being very progressive to being absolutely the opposite, um, which I think kind of, Argumentum et contrario may suggest that, you know, we're probably much better off in terms of continuity with the climate framework law. Thank you very much. And we have one more question from the audience from Jan Dash. Uh, do you include in this count subnational EG state laws on climate change, uh, for instance, from California? Yes, and we'll, we'll get back to that in this webinar. So we'll briefly talk about it as well. That's why explicitly try to avoid national climate framework law, just saying climate framework law, because indeed, you know, in many countries, um, subnational jurisdictions have the power, the authority to enact formal legislation, and California is a, a perfect example. So we will talk about that later. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're heading over to you, Matthias. Um, having heard from Michael about the general concept and the expected benefits of climate frameworks, could you tell us more a little bit about the elements commonly found in such framework laws? Sure. Thank you very much uh, to both of you, also to Michael for the excellent um, outline of the, the underlying rationale. Uh, I mean, basically, he's already spoken to the fact that there are, are uh, you know, such framework laws in a number of different places around the world. And so, of course, there is, there is not one single way of doing these, but there are essentially different designs that, that countries adopt to suit their own respective national context and their needs. And also, Subnational uh, ones, and so uh, there are a number of elements that that resurface. Um, you know, maybe they they aren't included in all of them, uh, but we can uh, distill some uh, some of those. If I if I may ask you to go to the next slide, please, uh, just to say in terms of background as to to what we've been doing. So 
we have in fact been distilling um, some of this information, also our insights on the different design elements from uh, um, case studies that we've looked at, um, uh, that we've uh, elaborated on with uh, partners as well, the LSE Grantham Institute on Climate Change being one of them, Idri in, uh, in France, uh, another, and we've been able to do work for the Greens in the European Parliament, um, uh, WWF uh, and the European Climate Foundation on this, all of which has contributed to our, our body of, of insights that I can, I can now share with you. And that's not just me, but actually a whole um, team of colleagues that are working on different aspects of this, including, I should say, actually on sub-national level um, um, laws that exist, for example, in, in the majority of the states in Germany underneath the, the federal level. If you, I could ask you to go to the next slide, please, um, to speak to still the, the next slide after the key functions. Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, you know, I think um, the questions that most of these um, laws try to answer is obviously setting some form of overarching objective and direction towards uh, which they work. So they specify a target or actually a number of targets possibly. And then they include uh, an element of what are the tools that get us towards that target. And that, you know, um, can mean a combination of planning towards getting there and then adopting specific measures. Um, they also spell out usually what are our internal institutional arrangements uh, for who's in charge of making sure that our government actually does get its act together and, and does follow the mechanisms that it's outlined in the law uh, and having to bring together you know, a range of uh, ministries or departments that need to interact and coordinate for that to be possible efficiently. And, and then there is often an element of our, how well are we doing? Are we on track? Uh, what's our progress? Um, and then there, there are external inputs of, of different kinds. And underlying all of that is, is, of course, political support. And if you could kindly show the, the visual that, that we've um, uh, put together to try and, and visualize these elements, how they can look, if you're thinking about it as a, a policy cycle, essentially, then you have included in the law targets the, that uh, define the needs for strategic planning towards how to get there. And especially if you include now a long-term dimension in the, in the laws, uh, something I'll speak to again uh, later on, then you know, it's not just about reaching targets in five or 10 years, but working towards a different state of your economies in 30 years time. And that really requires some foresight and strategic analysis. And then deciding on policies and measures that are based on the, the long-term trajectory that you've spelled out. And, and the monitoring and the reporting on progress that is done on um, the, your measuring how well you're doing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, then can lead to a revision of your plans and also your policies, of course. And uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, climate framework laws do include um, scientific advisory bodies. Uh, Michael just uh, already referred to the Committee on Climate Change in the UK as an example of that, and the most prominent one for sure, that, that provide additional independent analysis and can do so on any of the elements of the policy cycle, essentially. That, that very much depends on how the law uses this expertise. And then, of course, there is also public and stakeholder involvement that, that is being used in different ways by different countries, but can also essentially be coming in at any points of the, the cycle. All right, thank you very much uh, indeed. And maybe just to follow up quickly on what you just said, uh, we have a question from the audience um, that goes directly into, uh, I think, touch at least upon the scientific advisory bodies that, that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. It's a question from Jan Desch once more. How does legislation cope with inherent uncertainties in climate <laughs> modeling and projecting and forecasting? Right. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a key point, uh, which speaks to the fact that also uh, your um, long-term strategic planning towards the objectives needs to be frequently updated as well as the, the need to actually check 
on a, on a regular basis whether your policies are delivering what your impact assessment said they would do uh, and to to do reality checks on the one hand so you know are you delivering on the ground in reality the changes that you're seeking and also updating your forecasting and your projections uh, and the same actually can go for revising even the targets themselves and we've seen examples of this already the the uk as the country example already mentioned actually is one of those countries that has formally used a clause in the law to review its long-term target and to revise it based on updated scientific information, specifically the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matthias. I think that answers the question quite well. Um, and I don't see any other audience questions at this point, so let me just encourage you once more, use the chat or uh, question box to type in the questions. I'm happy to read them out and direct them to our experts. Um, Michael, if you want to chip in here, or otherwise, I would like to ask Matthias to elaborate a little bit more on the EU experience on, on the climate framework. Let's do that. Excellent. Let's do that. Okay, Great. Matthias. Thank you. Um, uh, if you could um, um, get onto the next slide, then please. Um, I've created a, a um, visual overview of where we stand in terms of countries that already have such laws. And really, the, the, the picture is quite diverse, but uh, what you can see from also the, the variety of color coding uh, is that, that there, are, there is definitely a, a number uh, of countries that already has such laws. They, they, we have distinguished here uh, on the basis of whether they include uh, a long-term dimension. Um, that's uh, you know, the 2050 focus because um, you know, our, our sense is that especially with the adoption of the Paris Agreement and its clear long-term uh, goals and also the pathway that it spells out, there's really now an additional function to climate framework laws and an extra need for governments to put such um, laws into place because they need to not only ensure that they're meeting near-term targets, but they need to essentially put procedures and mechanisms in place that help get the economy as a whole on track towards transformational change over the, the span of a couple of, of decades. And so there are, for example, um, countries like uh, um, Austria in, in the EU that already has a, uh, a climate framework law, but it was specifically put in place to help meet the 2020 target in the EU. So that's one of the earlier uh, laws, but actually it's not part of, uh, of the set that we have analyzed um, right now because we focus on the ones that have that long-term dimension. And there you have uh, some that, that have already actually not just been adopted, but also been revised already, such as in France and in the UK. Uh, you have say, examples such as Ireland and Denmark, where laws were adopted three, four, um, five years ago, but are now with um, new governments coming um, into power, also um, on the verge of being revised or actually replaced in both cases with more ambitious uh, pieces of legislation. And then you have a number of um, more recent um, uh, countries joining uh, the the that that group. So Germany adopted actually should have adopted today um, its uh, national framework law. The Netherlands only in June, and then there are drafts available for Latvia, in Croatia, and in Spain, for example. So the list is is growing, and the actual list with uh, uh, dates as well is on the next slide. And and this uh, list now does not include. Um, 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 does not include countries where we didn't have information, so there may well be more than we than we already have, you know, on our radar. But we're looking now at certainly half the EU in terms of countries that are are moving towards uh, framework laws. If I could uh, get to the next slide, then I can also show you that um, you know there's really uh, um, a trigger point uh, with the Paris Agreement that's notable. If you're looking at the accumulated number of laws that are uh, in place, um, uh, you know, the UK in 2008 was really the pioneer, uh, and then there were a couple of laws that were put in place over the years following that that were looking just at the short term. But those that with the 2050 perspective start really taking off in and around and certainly after the adoption of the Paris Agreement. 
And on the, the next slide, you can see that uh, it's not just about the EU member states in Europe, um, but I've excluded them from our further analysis for the moment, but um, there are also such laws in Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. And Norway is the, the only one in that quartet that has actually specifically got one that's already looking at 2050 as well. Now, I'll briefly run through a couple of examples of on the diff design elements. I mean, I will not speak to all of the elements. I'll, I'll try to be, uh, you know, capturing a few highlights. So clearly on targets, that's an essential element. Um, we do have laws that very specifically um, put in place not just quantitative long-term target, but also short-term targets. Um, the, many of them have, have both. There are examples where the long-term target is, is a qualitative one and not a quantitative one, so such as a, a low-carbon society by 2050, but then with a 2030 specific number. Um, and, and so there, there, there's, there are a variety of examples, but we see that there's a trend also with the ones that are being revised where um, and, uh, we're looking at quantitative long-term targets. Also, the, the UK example I already mentioned, there are some countries that are revising their long-term targets and those with laws do so in the framework of the law. Um, and, and part of the revision in France, for example, of the existing law that was only adopted in 2015 and, and revised this year was also based on the fact that they actually revised their long-term target. So that was one of the motivations for adopting and revising their, their own uh, law. And then uh, what's notable uh, in terms of uh, the ways that targets are being implemented is that the UK is the pioneer, started off with a carbon budget approach um, as a means of checking compliance, but also of breaking down the long-term target into interim milestones. So that you know, you're not just looking at you know, what's far in, in the future and in the distance, but that you have very concrete steps of getting there. And, and these emission budgets in the UK and in the French example, and a, a similar approach is, is being considered. I think for um, Ireland, it's also been applied in the new New Zealand law, um, is um, essentially setting these uh, quantitative limits for the country as a whole um, over five year periods and with a view into the future. So in the UK, that's 12 years in advance in, in, in France, 10 years in advance. And what that does is create very specific figures and, and some you know, midterm certainty and, and some stronger guarantee that you're actually getting towards your long-term objective. And if you can show the example on the next slide, that's actually showing what that looks like in terms of the trajectory for the UK. Um, and it and also shows how the, the mechanism can help you adjust over time. So, uh, the targets for the first three, the budgets for the first three budget periods in the UK were set with the adoption um, uh, of the original act. And then uh, with emissions actually being below project projections, the, that budget approach allowed the flexibility to then set lower budgets for future periods. Um, so there's an up inherent updating possibility here also. And, and just one more notable example, because it's more recent, the German law um, that is uh, um, really just hot off the press, uh, it establishes actually sector-specific budgets, annual budgets, and, and does so for all of the years from 2021 to 2030. So it not just signs an overarching budget, but actually breaks that down into sectors. So um, if I could get to the next slide, then I'll move on to that next segment from our um, visual at the beginning, which is about um, uh, strategic planning um, measures and also the, the monitoring processes. And what we clearly see here is that there are definitely regular cycles that are being built into the legislation. And as I was saying on the, um, against the, the question from our uh, viewer earlier, uh, I think that regular updating is, is quite important and, and having you know, a frequency that's either aligned with an electoral cycle or in line with the five-year updating process under the Paris Agreement. Um, and that has to, should be there ideally for planning and for regular adoption and identification of policies and measures and regular also for monitoring purposes. And there, what we have is essentially annual 
um, updating. If you could go to the next slide, then uh, you'll see that, especially on the reporting bit, which is the the bottom row, uh, that there are annual reports in any of the eight laws that we have uh, surveyed here. The only difference being who is issuing the report, essentially. And there we have two examples where it isn't the government itself necessarily, but it is the advisory um, council. Um, and there are differences still in the way that then these uh, reports are treated. So in some cases, they are directly sent to parliament. And then there's a parliamentary hearing. So the reporting also creates transparency and a possibility for public debate, uh, etc., which I think is another benefit um, of, of these laws. Then uh, moving on to the, the next slide, these external advisory bodies that uh, we've now referred to, they <clears throat> do exist in all of the eight laws that we've looked at here for the from EU member states. Um, you know, they can be a high council for climate change in France or um, you know, a climate panel, a council, the, the names vary, but the functions are relatively similar. Uh, it's only really the, the Dutch um, law that appoints an existing national agency to take on the job. Um, and what are those jobs? It's actually creating a watchdog function, um, providing scientific inputs on, on uh, up to all of the elements in the policy cycle and um, also therefore creating additional transparency and some, as, as Michael was saying earlier, uh, continuity across governments as well, because you have an institution that's independent of uh, electoral cycles. Um, in Germany, as um, sadly, the, the scope of the expert commission that's being set up is quite limited there. Uh, the, there is basically no uh, possibility for an own initiative report or additional analysis. It's largely a quality assessment function. Whereas in the, the UK Committee on Climate Change, it's it's got staff of 30 plus people, it has resources, and it is actually um, the go-to uh, place for government to get um, experts, uh, expertise and input on, on a variety of questions to do with national climate policy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, public participation to basically, I think, essentially come to a close here. Um, the, there are a variety of ways in which the laws include the public. Uh, in a number of them, it's not explicitly foreseen that public participation should take place or come in at certain uh, points in the policy cycle. That doesn't mean that there isn't public consultation. It's just that the, the fact that they aren't referenced in the law, that doesn't mean that there is national legislation that in any case already mandates that such uh, consultation takes place. And we haven't been able to, to dig deep enough to, to verify that this is the case in, in all of them. Um, in some cases, it's the council that basically then gets the, um, gets the, the duty of involving stakeholders. Um, in, in other cases, such as in Germany, it's very specific on every one of the five yearly cycles of policy packages, there is meant to be consultation. So those are the examples. And then we have, I think, quite a number of innovative um, formats being tried out. In Ireland, there's been uh, this concept of a civil citizen assembly that's been tried out. Um, and uh, now in, in France, there's, of course, an, an ongoing uh, new format um, for a citizen dialogue on, on climate change that I think are examples that other um, uh, countries could benefit from in terms of new ways of trying to involve the public in climate policy making. Next slide, please. Uh, just to be sure that indeed that, that was the end of, of my input on the design elements. I hope that was concise enough. I know that it's taken quite a bit of time. Thank you so much, Matthias. Very helpful indeed. And we do have uh, three questions um, already from the audience, which I'm happy to forward to you. One of them uh, was asked before you touched upon the public participation, but it goes in the same direction. Um, talking about the political process, uh, Simon Kalman is asking, what are some of the main challenges for stakeholders, such as political parties, civil society, etc., to lobby for cl ambitious climate frameworks? Um, you've mentioned the advisory bodies and that each country takes its own approach, but maybe you can have seen, or maybe not assessed per se, but maybe you've seen some of the major challenges and can comment on that. 
So I, I you know, indeed, I, I would say it's quite um, insightful to have the ability to research what the political origins are of uh, some of these laws, and we haven't been able to do that for all of them. Um, but uh, I think that's actually a crucial um, found, founding pillar for the long-term um, effectiveness and, and durability of the law. How much political support does it have? Um, and what we the, the the grandmother of all climate laws, you know, the UK Climate Act, basically, I think was certainly carried by public support. There there being a public campaign at the time by Friends of the Earth um, that was making this their big ask uh, to have this overarching law uh, put in place. And so they got a lot of public support and then also convinced um, politicians from, from both of the main major parties to support um, the principle. And so it's, I think that has been contributing to the, the fact that the, the law has been staying, staying as strong as it has over changes in government. And if you take the Swedish example, they actually started out with um, uh, a commission that was ex an exploratory committee to establish what would be uh, a good format and good design for the Swedish context. And that was uh, you know, a cross-party uh, committee that also actually went to the UK, spoke to uh, policymakers there from different parts of the political spectrum. Um, and so basically the, the um, Swedish law is largely based on a proposal that already had multi-party support. So those are examples, I think, to show that one can base uh, the the actual proposal from the start on on multi-party support that doesn't happen everywhere, but uh, I think it's it's crucial to consider ways in which uh, you know you can get broad political support involved, including buy-in from stakeholders for laws, not only for implementation but already for its adoption. Thank you very much. And the other two questions, I think we can frame somewhat together. We have uh, one question from Yandash uh, asking how many countries have adopted national laws that incorporate the increased ambition goals for NDCs, the national determined contributions as part of the Paris Agreement. So it's about ambition uh, enshrined in those laws. And maybe as a follow-up more specifically to the German law, um, did you assess the fact, Matthias, that Germany has sector-specific law and how do you assess this? Mm -hmm. And how do you assess the reduction intended in each sector? So maybe first on overall ambition in these climate laws, and the second part on the yeah. German sectoral ambition. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick. Um, the updating of targets as a, a provision that some of the laws have that is essentially equivalent to the the NDC cycle. But um, I cannot at the moment recall. Um, um, that that actually they necessarily always make that reference. Uh, I'm not even sure that 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 is that is the case. So I, I think the ones that are now being adopted after the Paris Agreement, they obviously reference the targets. They say as the Finnish um, law, for example, also spells out if there is an international commitment that we're making that supersedes or is stronger than what we're putting in law here, then that is what counts. But um, you know, the very specifically linking it to the Paris cycle that isn't uh, at least um, the standard that I've seen um, in, in the existing EU climate laws, but I think it, it could very well be something that, that countries very directly take on. For, for the EU, of course, what we have here as well is that these are, um, the NDC is something that's decided at the EU level, so there aren't EU member state uh, NDCs, so you have to take that into account as well. And for the, the Germans' um, sectoral um, uh, breakdown of the, the overall budget, I think that's a, it's a very good idea to try and, and get a better handle on uh, you know, how many um, missions are individual sectors currently contributing and what would be their respective effort that's required to um, help get the country as a whole on track towards its targets, because we have uh, seen in the past here that some sectors have been much slower in uh, in moving towards lower emissions or have actually um, still been increasing emissions such as in the transport sector and so I think trying to create additional transparency around that through such a sectoral breakdown um, I think is really the way forward and, and something that I think other laws may also adopt um, moving forward some stronger um, 
responsibility for contributions from all parts of government. Thank you very much, Matthias. Very helpful indeed. So let's turn now back to Michael again and the international perspective. Um, turning from the EU um, to the US and other parts of the world. Michael, what's, what are your experiences there? Thank you. My observations is probably the better word. Um, so the first slide, thank you for putting it up. I, I, I want to show by looking at a couple of other non-European jurisdictions just how different the contexts are. Um, around the world in which such laws are being discussed and in some cases fortunately also being adopted um, because I do think that many of these stories are to some extent also quite different from what we see in Europe but not to say that Europe is perfectly homogeneous of course that's not the case um, and the first one is really sort of a story a, a cautionary tale of what can happen when you when you do not have a robust legislative basis for national climate action um, as you might recall it seems like an alternate reality thinking back a decade, but um, after about you know eight years of relative inaction under the administration of George W. Bush, um, when President Obama took office, climate change and climate policy was a big item on his political agenda and part of his campaign promises. And so very early on, um, work started on comprehensive legislation. He repeatedly said that he thought this was something that Congress should tackle and not um, be done through administrative, you know, through executive rulemaking, but really through statutory legislation. And I, I want to also highlight why I think this is really important. Climate change is an extremely complex issue, of course. Um, going back to what Matthias said, you know, many of these laws incorporate robust and, and very thoughtful ways of engaging stakeholders. Um, I also want to highlight that the law itself statutory law evolves in a more transparent and formal process than say executive rulemaking within a government. And I think that is also part of this, the importance or the secret, let's say, why these, these framework laws and the statutory law, um, I think is important um, to deal with climate change. And I think that the debates and the civil society, well, say the discord in some jurisdictions and all the way to civil unrest in some countries about climate policy or certainly demonstrations and protests and so on, underscores why it is so important to have a broad national consensus on climate action enshrined in the law before taking action. So um, this was kind of the agenda. This was what President Obama wanted the Congress to do. And there were many different proposals in, the, in previous years, but the big sort of the signature proposal that would have become an enshrined US climate policy, and even before the UK, UK Climate Change Act would have had a vision all the way to beyond 2050 in terms of emissions reductions, was what many might remember, you know, the Waxman-Markey Act. It passed the House of Representatives in June 2009 as um, HR 2454. Unfortunately, politics sort of changed. There was a midterm election. The Democrats lost their majority in the Senate. Um, healthcare and, and other policy issues kind of took, took precedence. And so it never was passed. It has to go through both chambers of Congress. It never entered into effect. But I think, you know, it would have set, it was a comprehensive, a massive bill, several hundred pages, up almost a thousand pages, if I remember correctly, with policies, measures, funding, financing rules, and of course targets, and the key sort of policy would have been a comprehensive nationwide cap and trade system to achieve this ambitious um, emissions reduction roadmap that was outlined in the law itself. What are we left now that we didn't get that? And the opportunity has never come back to enact such a uh, bipartisan, you know, or at least, well, push through with, with, with the support of, of a party in with the required majority. What we've left, what we've been left with is that President Obama had to use all the powers he had under existing laws, such as the Clean Air Act um, and, and, and some other legislation. Um, you might remember also the, the, the stimulus package when the economy collapsed, that contained some, some authorizations as well. So he used everything he had at his disposal to advance executive rulemaking and advanced very significant rulemaking proposals through the Environmental Protection Act, um, um, EP, through the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate, for instance, emissions from stationary sources, the clean power plan or new source performance standards from um, the transport sector, the cafe standards, etc. All of these, of course, once the government changed and President Trump took office as part of his 
very explicit campaign promises have been rolled back since. There's not a single major cl climate policy sort of signature regulation or rulemaking that President Obama had advanced that is not currently being rolled back or challenged in the courts. So that shows you why it is so important to have this continuity, especially in some sectors like energy and transportation where long-term in infrastructure investments, long-term investments in say electricity generating assets, et cetera, have to be done with some understanding of what are the climate policies that we will face down the road. And this is really something that the US has lacked. So enough about the US, but I think it, it really underscores you know, why, why it would have been so great, so useful for climate policy, for consistent and continuous climate policy to have that kind of congressional statutory framework law. If I go to the next slide and I'll accelerate a little bit from here onwards, um, I just want to mention because even though we do not have a national ambitious climate policy in the US, we do have several subnational jurisdictions, that is states in this federal system, um, advancing very ambitious policies. In many cases, whole baskets, whole portfolios of different laws and regulations, including targets. These targets are not all enshrined in, 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 in subnational statutory law, so state law, state legislation, many of them are in executive orders, but it still gives you a sense um, that you know, there's a number of very influential and important states with large populations, with strong economies. California, for instance, is often mentioned as being the sixth largest economy in the world, adopting targets that are similar to the ones that we saw being uh, discussed and partly enacted in, in Europe, for instance. Let's look at California more specifically. Um, so back in 2006, again, even before um, say, for instance, the UK adopted its Climate Change Act. The UK already, uh, the the, Calif the state of California at the time, under the governor of um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, advanced legislation in in the state legislature, which is known as Assembly Bill 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, and that made a splash because it was a time when, at the national level, there wasn't much happening. It set a target um, in the law at the time of achieving, you know, at, at the going back to 1990 emissions levels by 2020, which sort of translated to a 15% reduction versus business as usual. And last um, two, three years back now, so in 2016, uh, Senate Bill 32 and a corresponding Assembly um, House of, uh, well, Assembly Bill amended um, AB 32 of 2006 to include a target all the way to 2030. Now you may recall that actually California does have a target for 2050. And in fact, since last year, late last year, under Jerry Brown, one of his last acts um, was an executive order committing California to achieve carbon neutrality, so net zero emissions by 2045, which is in enormously ambitious, but that is not enshrined in formal legislation. It is not part of the Global Warming Solutions Act yet. So what we have there is only a roadmap all the way to 2030 with this 40% reduction target. And um, an existing entity, the California Air Resources Board, is mandated in this relatively short bill, uh, act. It's only about 15 pages um, with doing a, a number of different things. So implementing a mandatory emissions reporting um, framework. The U US does have a nationwide one. The EPA does implement um, the greenhouse gas Mon monitoring and reporting rule, but California has its own um, and it's administered by ARB. Um, of course, it, the, the, the act sets out that emissions limit that I already mentioned, but another thing that ARB has to do and, and has been has done twice already is adopt a scoping plan in which it exports all the different policies and measures that would need to be or could be adopted, direct regulations, market mechanisms, and other voluntary and such measures that can and should be explored in order to achieve, to secure achievement of the targets. And very importantly, it contained a, a bigger chunk of it is geared towards creation of a statewide market-based instrument, which is the cap and trade system, um, and which has been operational since 2013. Um, it was elaborated under the umbrella of the Western Climate Initiative with some other um, states. And in fact, by now, it's really only Canadian provinces which are cooperating um, in, in that. And specifically, it's the province of Quebec for a while it was also the province of Ontario, but politics changed there after an election. So they withdrew from what is now a linked and uh, you know cross-border, um, you could say almost international cap and trade system on a sub-national basis, quite a unique creation. And it covers 85% of, of Californian emissions. So it really gets to um, all the major sources of emissions, including transportation by including refiners, fuels, 
that's a big difference from the EU. It does not create like a new climate change committee, for instance, to monitor what's going on and, and, and hold the Californian government accountable, but it does create an environmental justice advisory committee, which highlights also how important this issue of climate and environmental justice um, has been in California in the debate, where often you have you know, climate or environmental justice groups really casting an eye, how will this affect, for instance, minorities, low-income households, et cetera? How will these policies potentially have distributional effects? Um, this is a debate that I think in California has been stronger and, and, and often more controversial than, say, in many European um, jurisdictions. Let me now look away from, you know, we've talked mostly about developed countries so far and really switch our focus to a developing country context to underscore how different um, the context can be. Let's look at Mexico. So Mexico um, had had a number of headlines um, um, several years ago, back when it adopted its national um, climate law in 2012, which became sort of the, the first national climate framework law in a developing country. And it showed that Mexico is taking its its um, commitment to climate action very seriously, despite being a developing country. Now, of course, it is an OECD member, but you know, it's still, it still it has a different status than say the US or European countries. Um, let's call it an emerging economy in that sense. And um, it gave it that sort of visibility internationally, I, I, I feel um, that it is a, a serious player on climate policy. Um, the law is very comprehensive, much more so than for instance, the Global Warming Solutions Act in California kind of a bit more similar to the Waxman-Markey Act that never uh, passed the Senate in the US. So it's it's a long act. It has, um, it assigns responsibilities across all levels of government. It has provisions for mitigation, for adaptation, for finance. Um, it sets in motion processes to assess vulnerability in the country, create a risk atlas of climate change impacts, transparency rules, and a number of sectoral policies. And also in Matias and I know this very well because we've been involved in the discussion in Mexico, creation of market-based instruments. So development of things such as a cap and trade system to reduce emissions in certain sectors like power and industry. And it does have targets. And to go back to the question earlier, so it essentially now reflects the NDC and amendment of the, of the um, Mexican framework law became necessary in 2018 to reflect the NDC, which of course was adopted in Mexico after this law had been already enacted. So that's a good example of how the international climate um, cooperation framework or regime has sort of had repercussions then into climate framework laws at the national level. And a number of institutions, some of which pre-existed and some of which were created by this law, help implement, monitor, et cetera, provide advice on, on, um, on the actual operation of the Mexican climate law. Thank you very much, um, Michael. Some of the other think, countries, in a brief... There's uh, one just, more. Yeah, sorry. Very briefly, and this yeah. is Mongolia, because I'm actually working with Mongolia and, and engaged there. And I think it's a good example of, of the other end of the spectrum, essentially, from Europe all the way to developing countries, it really has other priorities, is struggling with other social and economic priorities. It's very vulnerable to climate change, however, in part due to its lifestyles, you know, hurting, etc., a large part of the population dependent on nature dependent on being able to engage in, in livestock herding um, and desertification, changing precipitation patterns, et cetera, are really, really a challenge that's already being felt in Mongolia. And at the same time, even though in absolute terms, small population, very low population density, it is not a great contributor to overall emissions per capita. It does have high energy intensity. Um, a striking figure that you know I learned, and I don't want to go necessarily in winter, is that between summer and winter you have up to 100 degrees Celsius difference in temperatures, which tells you you know how much heating um, in winter is necessary, and to some extent increasingly probably cooling in summer as well. And they do not have any climate legislation per se, and even some of the existing laws, formal laws like the environmental protection law. Um, the, the air protection law, et cetera, barely mention climate at all. The air protection law sets out a few provisions, but there's nothing really robust and integrative and overarching. And this has created sort of a patchwork problem that right now there is no clear mandate, no clear institutional mandate, also not the kind of appropriation and allocation of resources that we think you know, are absolutely necessary to advance ambitious climate policy. The ministry has a very small staff Part of the the, the, ins, the the institutional framework that is charged with implementing climate projects is dependent on foreign project funding. 
So it's a very variable sort of um, and, and volatile funding basis. And so this is a context in which having one framework law that would mainstream climate into other sectors and also create a more robust space for institutions could help Mongolia really become more consistent and also ambitious on climate policy. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and sorry for pressing ahead. The time is almost running, uh, run out already, but let me just uh, ask, well, first of all, thank our both presenters and maybe ask you, because we've had, looked, uh, had a look at the status quo of climate legislation across the world in the EU, the US, and uh, Mexico and Mongolia now as well, um, maybe turning towards the future, um, just, just a few sentences each, uh, where do you see this, this concept going? Maybe. Um, we start with um, Matthias on the on the European perspective. What are next steps here, and then uh, close with Michael on the international perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shana, and and thanks for that uh, overview, Michael. I, I think one of the the points that you made um, on Mongolia just now, I think, is really uh, something that I think will further the the spread um, of. Uh, um, national framework laws as a concept because they really they they support um, they facilitate a country's ability to meet its international obligations. I really think that a number of uh, um, uh, um, uh, countries that the international dimension, the Paris Agreement, will be a, a big driver um, for also convincing um, national opponents to the adoption of such a framework law and to putting resources to the issue and, and creating uh, an, an implementation hierarchy and process, I, I think it will help. And at the same time, I think that it's the, the Paris Agreement that also uh, necessitates that governments uh, do this. And a lot more governments that previously had to think about uh, achieving targets because so many more now have something that they have pledged uh, um, as their contribution to the international system. So, you know, with that pledge comes the responsibility to try and figure out how to deliver and they need to integrate it into their existing um, systems. And, and I think that's, uh, that's going to be, you know, a, a force that will still um, have this, this train moving forward and not just in the EU. Um, and if I may add, um, there is also a process now and a proposal for an EU climate law uh, in the EU, as you saw in the, the examples of our work on this, actually colleagues uh, of mine have already uh, published ideas on this, and I, I, I recommend uh, you know anyone with an interest in this EU climate law to check out our website, ecologic.eu, to download it there. But that's an ongoing process. The, the incoming Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, has promised that she will put a draft of such an EU climate law forward within the first 100 days of taking office. That term is likely to start on the 1st of December. So, you know, come March, we should have a proposal for an EU climate law in which she has promised to enshrine uh, a target of uh, climate neutrality for the EU by 2050. So clearly, again, with that long-term dimension. And we, we don't have specifics yet. I think this is a time now to develop ideas of what should we include it. There are a lot of uh, things that the EU can learn from the examples that already exist at member state level and in other constituencies. And so um, I, I think this will be a topic that will stay with us uh, very much uh, for the years to come. Thank you very much, Matthias. Michael, you've got the closing remarks. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I would echo what Matthias said. I think that beyond Europe, you will continue also seeing um, a, a remarkable dynamic on this kind of uh, laws. I think just... The, the simple thing, the simple fact is that as countries around the world are getting more serious on climate change, the necessity to have some sort of integrative framework is growing in importance as well. And the acknowledgement, the recognition of that necessity, because climate change is an extremely cross-sectoral, cross-cutting issue. It affects all areas of our daily lives, really, and across all sectors of the economy. And what you see in some countries that haven't yet sort of thought about how to integrate this, like Mongolia, is that you have a number of different sectoral policies, often inconsistent with each other and certainly inconsistent with the kind of climate action that they at the same time, you know, profess to advance and, and commit to. So really, I think we, we have seen growth in um, indications of or expressions of intent to adopt climate framework laws and already have seen several new climate framework laws in Latin America. In Africa, I think this trend will continue. 
Um, and I think it's an exciting area to follow because this really is sort of, as we have seen in some cases, litigation as well. This is really something countries are held accountable to. And it also reflects the kind of, to go back to what I harped about before, the kind of societal content consensus that I think we do need in such an well, extremely challenging policy ambition, aspiration, in which we do have to balance competing goals and objectives often. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, with that, um, that's only left to me to thank uh, our two experts. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations. Thank you to all of you who have been watching uh, to your excellent questions. Uh, thank you to our funders and partners. And um, yeah, you can find this and other recorded webinars and FX outputs at our project website, uh, which is energyfuturex.org. And of course, uh, you can find some of the outputs that uh, Matthias mentioned on the Ecologic website, www.ecologic.eu. So with this, we close this webinar. Uh, my name is Anna Riedel. Thank you so much for your attention and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.